listening to the Stories of Subi podcast, which has been produced for the Subi East project. The Stories of Subi are brought to you by Development WA in collaboration with Creating Communities Australia. The Subi East area has a rich history, and we're bringing you conversations with the people who can provide interesting perspectives on the great memories, history and changes they've seen. Dr Jackie Skerlock worked at PMH for over 30 years. While she was there long enough to remember the original old wooden hospital, affectionately dubbed the Snake Pit, Jackie has kept that love and that passion caring for children throughout the decades. Tell me about the PMH Snake Pit. What was that? Ah, well, that in fact is the original building in 1909 that was the hospital. It's a wooden building, and in my day, it was part of emergency and was pretty grotty. So the old place was called the Snake Pit because well, we, it, it was, was pretty, just pretty grotty, pretty rough. But it ended up becoming the chapel and then the multi-faith centre. And so because it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's iconic. And I think you've got to remember that in 1909, Children were seen at Royal Perth Hospital and admitted there, but not until they were 18 months old. And so under 18 months, really, they were just looked after at home or that was it. People realised that they needed a children's hospital. And I must say, travelling overseas where I was often working in units that were attached to adult hospitals, I used to feel that the kids were looked on as almost second-rate patients, where PMH, Princess Margaret Hospital, they were kings. (laughs) They were what, you know, we just, we knew that everything had to revolve around them. It was to do the best for them always. You started at PMH as a young doctor and you stayed there for over 30 years. I mean, I started as a student at PMH way back in 1966 and Pat Ryan was my mentor at that stage. When somebody came up as an outpatient we would be seeing them first, taking the history, doing the examination and then presenting that to Pat and that in fact really taught us a lot and she was the most caring person, an amazing doctor who set up all sorts of things. In those days they really weren't specialists They were paediatricians with a special interest in something. Many of them were doing public and private. Initially, they weren't even paid for their public work. They gave that free. They were called honorees. What was it about the culture of PMH that people were, you know, going above and beyond? Yeah, I think it was just what you did. Morning tea, people would come and sit in this great big dining room and would be chatting and you would learn a hell of a lot from what was being discussed. It was a, a really friendly place. I think that was it. And I think when you're a small hospital, then it's much easier. It was the day of the ward sister who knew everyone and knew everything, and she was God. <laughs> when we first started, there were these great barn-type wards. So there was no division or anything. There were just beds down these huge, build, you know, Huge hallways of, yeah. of yeah. beds. And, and the ICU was this great big long building. And then it had a, a sort of small ward down the end with just two beds. And that was the intensive care unit. And, and they were really sick kids that were down there. You were terrified when you had to sort of look after those at night and things. It was in the 80s that we were monitoring a large number of babies. Um, the SIDS Foundation had got going in 1977 with parents who set up a group in Western Australia to support those who had lost children from sudden unexpected death. And they were very involved with the coroner's pathologist, Dr John Hilton. Um, And you need to have people looking at the child to make sure, why is it doing this? Is there some underlying disease? Is there some acute infection or something that needs to be assessed first? And that's what we were concerned about. The SIDS rate dropped once we learned that you don't sleep babies on their tummies, you sleep them on their back. Both in New Zealand and in Tasmania, 
and also in, in the UK. So there were probably three studies that really showed that if you were sleeping babies on their tummies, they had a higher incidence of sudden unexpected, four times the risk. The Red Nose campaign for money to find out the cause of SIDS had got going in about 88, 89. And so we had this money that we were able to, you know, really start the campaigns. What was it like for you when these young children would die and you would have to deal with that and their parents? It, it's always hard when a child dies. I can remember a very special little boy who ended up dying in the end, who we all adored. I think he must have been about a year old. Um, mm. And um, he did have a, a very severe lesion and he struggled and, and he was just gorgeous. Dear little toddler, but in the end, you know, he didn't make it. Um, and, and it, you know, and that's where you do need to give support. Certainly, you've had, you've got, you have social workers that to support you as well. You try hard to keep children alive, but you realise that some situations that it's it's impossible. And I think it's just, but when you see the ones that survive and the way things have improved over the years, then that's what's so exciting. I mean, when I started as a student at PMH, cystic fibrosis kids were lucky to reach the age of 14 or 15. Mm. And now they're in their 40s, 50s. And, and it, it doesn't happen very often. And that's the one thing as a paediatrician is pretty sad. It's not like a GP, because a GP sees someone from birth to death. We finish by the time they're about, you know, 17, 18, even the long-term difficult ones. And um, I got this lovely letter from one of the cystic fibrosis children I'd looked after as an adult, sending me a picture of herself and her baby. And wow. that was just, just amazing. Tell me about your patient who had one of the first bone marrow transplants. Oh, he was the third child in the family, the boy, after two girls, and he just was not thriving. He was sickly, and it worked out that his thymus, which is the big gland in the upper chest that supplies a, a lot of immunological um, input, just wasn't working properly. And he had a sister who was the same blood match as he, you know, immunologically. And so um, Dr. Helen Lays, who was the haematologist at the time, managed to do a bone marrow aspiration from his sister and gave it to him. So that was in 78. 78 and he got the bone marrow transplant. And at the 79 telethon, he was walk, thriving, walking onto the stage with a great big tin of the money he'd collected for paediatric research. How hard, it was a pretty new thing to do at oh, that time. I think it was scary to do um, because you knew it had been done in other parts of the world and of course you've got to get the parental permission but it looked as though this child was going to die. I mean, he, he really was ill. He, he, he looked as though he wasn't going to make it. And we knew that he wouldn't unless there was something that he was given. But I think it, it was within a few weeks that you could start to see his gut was coping and he was managing. He just thrived. It was super. And then I saw him at one stage as a dad. And I thought, this is just so exciting. Do you have a sense of, of the physical place there? What, what does it mean to you? Having spent so many years there, it does feel like a special place. That was where so many of my triumphs, my failures and things occurred. It is a site that I think we need to make sure that it's not forgotten and, you know, remember all the things that happened. Thanks for listening to the Stories of Subi podcast. It was created by Creating Communities Australia for Development WA.